Welcome back to Conflicts of Interest. This is episode 594. I'm the host of the show, Kyle Anslone. A lot to talk about on today's show, a lot of important information on the wars in Ukraine and Gaza. So this will be one you will want to share. Uh, You can find the show at the Libertarian Institute or on the blog at antiwar.com, YouTube, Rumble, or Odyssey for the video uh, version of the show. And of course, it's up anywhere you can listen to audio podcasts. If you want to see more of my appearances, uh, this week I was on my friend Kyle Matovich show to discuss Libertarian Party politics and Donald Trump going to the Libertarian Party convention. I am returning to Judging Freedom, that's Judge Andrew Napolitano's show, today at 3 p.m. That's May 16th. Uh, Catch it live if you can. There's always a pretty good interactive chat uh, in in his audience that, you know, it's it's great when you guys are in there and, and you let the judge know that you're enjoying my appearances. And I will also be returning to the Scott Horton show this week. Uh, So keep an eye out on Scott's feed for that. All right, time to get into today's news. First up here, Blinken justifies decision to cancel Ukrainian elections. So Secretary of State Antony Blinken made an unannounced visit to Kiev on Tuesday and delivered a speech where he justified President Zelensky's decision to postpone elections. Presidential elections are due to be held in March, but they weren't, and Zelensky will remain in office after his term ends on May 20th. Ukrainian parliamentary parliamentary elections were scheduled to be held last year in October, but were also canceled. Zelensky and other Ukrainian officials have justified the decision by pointing to Ukraine's constitution, which prohibits elections during martial law. Martial law was first declared when Russia invaded and has been extended since. However, at one point, Zelensky made it clear that he could hold a vote if he wanted to. Last year, Zelensky said that he could hold an election if the U.S. and other Western countries paid for them and Ukrainian legislators agreed to amend the Constitution. He later rolled out the idea and said there had been no pressure from Ukraine's Western backers to hold a vote despite the claim that the proxy war is a fight for democracy. And so, you know, of course, this presents all kinds of problems for the Western narrative here. Uh, Obviously, it is possible to hold votes in countries during wartime, although I, you know, agree that it does add some complicating factors when you say have 6 million or so Ukrainians living outside of Ukraine, uh, some of those even living in Russia. Uh, and, And so, you know, I'm not sure what even the result would be if Ukraine were to hold an election. It would seem to me that maybe a very hard line ish candidate, a very hardcore Ukrainian nationalist, uh, could potentially end up coming to power just based on the people who are in the country and actually likely to vote versus, uh, you know, would people in the territory held by Russia be able to vote or in the regions annexed by Russia be able to vote? Uh, you know, you know, there are some more problems and complications here. And, uh, you know, I'm not saying it would be easy for Ukraine to hold an election, but had they been working on this and establishing what the, the rules would be, it probably would be something they would have been able to do. It seems part of the reason Zelensky isn't interested in holding an election is there are other people in Ukraine who are very politically popular or even maybe more politically popular than Zelensky, and that includes the former commander-in-chief of the Ukrainian Armed Forces, General Zelushny. So Blinken, when he was in Kiev, made the comments that the U.S. and Europe have been helping Ukraine to build diplomatic pillars, including free and fair elections, but said that a vote can only happen when conditions are right. That's why we are working with the government and civil society groups to shore up Ukraine's election infrastructure. That's why as soon as Ukrainians agreed that conditions allow all Ukrainians, all Ukrainians, including those displaced by Russian aggression, can exercise their right to vote. People in Ukraine and around the world have confidence that voting process is free, fair, and secure, Blinken said. So... You know, I'm not sure. My guess is Ukraine doesn't hold an election for some time still, probably not until after this war is over and the Ukrainian side has accepted a peace deal. You know, I've heard some comment commentators and even those who I would consider to have, you know, more reasonable views as far as 
America's outlook and involvement in this war say that May 20th means that you Zelensky is no longer a legitimate ruler in Ukraine and therefore Russia might try to assassinate him. I, I think this is kind of wrong on both counts uh, to say that he's no longer a legitimate ruler is you know, to, to, to some degree truth, but to some degree untruth too. You know, the Ukrainian constitution is what it is, and conducting a vote in wartime would be difficult. And then on the other side of that, I do think there should be a realization here that it seems to me to be very unlikely that, and even given Zelensky's stance and, and what he has said during this war, that Russia would end up with a more reasonable negotiating partner if Ukraine held elections. I think actually quite the opposite is true. That it's very possible a very strong Ukrainian nationalist will win who would you, you know, be ideologically driven to continue to fight against Ukraine and to try uh, Russia and try to recapture all of Ukrainian territory where Zelensky is an actor. And, you know, right now he has on the military fatigues, and I think he's playing a role more than he's ideologically committed to what he's doing right now. Because if you looked at his presidency uh, be before the Russian invasion, his policies, his actions were quite different. All right, next up here, uh, this one. Blinken announces $2 million in military aid for Ukraine as Russian forces advance. So as, uh, as Blinken was in Kiev, he announced a new $2 billion in new military aid for Ukraine as Russian forces continue to advance in Ukraine's northeastern uh, Kharkiv oblast after launching a new offensive in the region on Friday. Blinken, who made the announcement in Kiev, said the $2 billion in foreign military financing, a State Department program that gives foreign governments money to purchase U.S. weapons. The majority of the funds are being pulled from the new $61 billion foreign military aid bill. Uh, so it was $95 billion, but $61 billion in that was uh, marked for Ukraine and, and arms for Ukraine. That was recently authorized by Congress, although $400 million is coming from previously allocated funds. I think that would be uh, just a part of the omnibus spending bill. Blinken would not detail the weapons that will be provided with the $2 billion in aid, but said it would be spent in several different ways. We put this together in a first-of-its-kind defense enterprise fund, and it has three components. One is to provide weapons today, so this will assist Ukraine in acquiring those weapons. He said it would also be used to help build up Ukraine's defense industrial bank base and who knows what that means, because I'm sure Russia will bomb any kind of arms manufacturing plants that Ukraine is trying to build. And he says this will help Ukraine purchase military equipment from other countries, not just the United States for Ukraine's use. And this is interesting, of course, because those FMF funds are supposed to be just to purchase American weapons. I think maybe only Israel gets an exemption and is allowed to purchase weapons from other countries. Uh, with the FMF finding other than Ukraine. So the new weapons package brings the total amount of U.S. military aid announced since the $61 billion uh, in, the, in the spending bill for the proxy war was authorized to about $9 billion. So that's a lot of money in just a few weeks. Standing alongside Blinken, the Ukrainian foreign minister, that's Dmitry Kuleba, complained about delays in Western weapons shipments. He said every delay in supply results in setbacks on the front lines. This is a general rule. We appreciate the sincere commitment of the United States to compensate deliveries, delays in deliveries with new announcement and new deliveries. Blinken was asked that the U.S. would allow Ukraine to use U.S.-provided weapons to hit Russian territory, which risks major escalation. Russia recently warned the U.K. that it could hit British military sites if Ukraine uses British-provided weapons to attack and hit targets inside of Russia. Blinken claimed the U.S. does not encourage or enable Ukrainian strikes on Russian territory, but said it was ultimately a decision for Ukraine. The U.S., the new 
U.S. military aid for Ukraine is not expected to help achieve victory, but instead will prolong the war. Russia's push in Kharkiv is stretching Ukraine's defensive lines thin, and they were already at risk of collapsing. During Blinken's visit to Ukraine, the Ukrainian military announced it was pulling back forces from some areas in Kharkiv, including the largest village in the area where the fighting is located. And the Ukrainian frontline soldiers talked about there were just no frontline defenses set into place, and the Russian forces in some places just walked across the border and were able to seize quite a substantial amount of territory in doing so. All right, next up here, this story is very alarming. Estonia seriously discussing sending troops to Ukraine. So NATO member Estonia is seriously discussing the possibility of sending troops to western Ukraine to fill non-combat roles to free up Ukrainian soldiers so they can be sent to the front. Such a deployment would mark a significant NATO escalation and involvement in the war. While the Estonian troops wouldn't be sent for combat, they would be directly and publicly joining the war effort, making them potential targets for Russia and risking a direct Russian NATO class, which could quickly become nuclear. The Estonian president's national security advisor said on May 10th that Estonia is a country with an active duty military of about 7,000 troops, would prefer to make such moves a part of a NATO mission to show broader combined strength and determination, but he said he wouldn't rule out the deployment as a part of a smaller coalition. And so think about this. You have a country that has 7,000 troops, and they're in a position where they could send those troops to Ukraine, get those troops killed, and significantly ratchet up the pressure on America to, to get directly involved in a war with Russia that would ultimately turn nuclear. This is absolute insanity. So uh, the U uh, Estonian official said, we should be looking at all possibilities. We shouldn't have our minds restricted as to what we can do. And uh, these sounded awful. These remarks sounded awful similar to what the French president Emmanuel Marcon recently said. And he has said on three or four occasions now that he is willing to send French troops and is floated the idea of sending French troops into Ukraine. All right, next up here, Biden signs bill banning Russian uranium gives billion for American production. So President Joe Biden has signed a bill into law that bans Russian uranium imports and provides nearly three billion in handouts to boost domestic production. The bill provides an exemption to allow U.S. companies to import Russian uranium if they have no other options. So on Monday, the Prohibiting Russian Uranium Imports Act became law after months of delay. The House passed the legislation in December, but Ted Cruz blocked the vote over unrelated objections to provisions that were removed from the National Defense Authorization uh, Bill that was passed a couple months ago, the Senate ultimately passed this bill last month, but then Biden waited a month to sign it. A lobbyist for the American uranium producers criticized the government for taking so long to pass the law, but celebrated the Russian ban. So Scott Melby, the executive vice president of the mining company of Uranium Energy and the president of the Uranium Producers of America, said it's kind of ridiculous that it took so long to get it done at this stage, but we're just glad that we got here. The law requires a 90 day ban on Russian enriched uranium imports unless the nuclear fuel is deemed to be essential. The government can grant waivers through 2028. Additionally, the law provides $2.7 billion to produce domestic uranium production. While Washington has attempted to completely isolate Moscow and cripple the Russian economy, the U.S. has continued to import Russian uranium. Two years after the invasion of Ukraine, the U.S. imports about $1 billion in nuclear fuel from Russia every year. The Washington Center John Brasso was instrumental in pushing the legislation in the Senate and said his state plans to be vital in expanding uranium production in the U.S. American nuclear industry is ready to transition away from Russian uranium. Wyoming has the resources needed to produce at home. The first step is permitting 
permanently removing all Russian energy, including uranium, from the American marketplace. And I thought this was important and worth writing up and talking about on the show because I think we see some of the artillery, art, um, other motives here for the war in Ukraine. It's not just a matter of the defense base profiting off of this, but it's also the energy base as well because Russia is a large energy producer. And so taking all this Russian energy off the market will force Americans to buy more expensive American energy. All right, next up here, White House says Georgia's foreign agents bill threatens relations. So the White House said on Tuesday that if a foreign agents bill passed by Georgia's parliament becomes law, the U.S. will have to fundamentally reassess its relations with the country. The bill, titled On Transparency of Foreign Influence, requires non-governmental organizations that receive at least 20% of their funding from abroad to register as foreign agents. Proponents of the bill in the Georgian Dream Party have compared it to the U.S. Foreign Agents Registration Act, which is FARA, which requires individuals or entities engaging in lobbying or other activity on behalf of a foreign country to register as foreign agents with the U.S. Department of Justice. The U.S. and other Western nations have compared the bill to a similar law enacted by Russia in 2012. The Russian law was a part of Moscow's response to the U.S. funding NGOs and opposition parties. The White House press secretary condemned the Georgian bill as a Kremlin-style foreign agents legislation. Georgia's president is expected to veto the bill, but the parliament could override it. The White House press spokeswoman said it is unclear whether Parliament will try to override a potential veto. We have been outspoken about our concerns with this legislation, which runs counter to democratic values and would move Georgia further away from the values of the European Union and let's not forget NATO. So hopefully, I guess, Georgia passes it for that reason. Uh, But uh, again, you know, this is pretty hypocritical from Washington. And it's really just about the U.S. empire. And we use these NGOs and political parties, media organizations. We fund them to have a lot of influence in these countries. So the Slovak prime minister, Robert Fico, is expected to survive after shooting So Slovakia's prime minister, that's Robert Fico, or maybe Fico, was shot multiple times on Wednesday in an assassination attempt after a government meeting in in a central city. He was in grave condition, but is expected to survive, according to the deputy prime minister. I guess in the end he will survive, the deputy prime minister told the BBC. He's not in a life-threatening situation in the moment. Earlier, the Solvat defense minister spoke with reporters outside of the hospital where FICO is being treated and said the prime minister was fighting for his life and underwent a three and a half hour surgery. We are hoping that he's strong enough to make it. FICO, who is 59 years old, while shot was, while green a crowd, the interior minister said a 71 year old man was detained for the shooting and that the initial investigation found a clear political motive. Uh, My understanding is this man is a member of the opposition party, although it's not clear exactly what party of uh, what policy of FICO or if it's, you know, just his overall policies that he objected to. I know a lot of people have pointed to, oh, FICO said he was going to do something about COVID recently or it's about his unwillingness to give weapons to Ukraine. And and there certainly are possibilities here, but I would not jump to conclusions. Uh, conclusions on the reason for his shooting until we, you know, have more details uh, about, you know, what the actual shooter said. All right, getting into some news on Israel here. This one from Dave DeCamp, antiwar.com. Israeli ministers join March calling for settlements in Gaza and the expulsion of Palestinians. So members of the Israeli government joined thousands of Israelis in a march in southern Israel on Tuesday, led by far-right activists calling for the reestablishment of Jewish settlements in the Gaza Strip and the expulsion of Palestinians. The march commemorated the 76th anniversary of the day Israel celebrates as its Independence Day, also known as the Nakba or the catastrophe to the Palestinians, as more than 700,000 Palestinians were 
expelled from their homes to create the modern state of Israel in 1948. Joining the march in the city of Sardot were two ministers in Benjamin Netanyahu's government. That's the communications minister, who is a member of the Likud party, which is Netanyahu's party, and the national security minister, Itmar Ben-Gavir, the leader of the Jewish power party. No surprise he was in attendance. The communications minister said, in order to preserve the security achievements that our soldiers lost their lives for we must resettle gaza with security forces and settlers that will embrace love the land with love this is the only way to make hamas nazis pay the price and defend our nation and country ben gavir also spoke and said the settlements and the expulsion of the palestinians are the only true solution to the situation in gaza we must return to gaza now we are coming to the holy land and Second, we must encourage immigration, encourage the voluntary immigration of the residents of Gaza. It is moral. And this is something that uh, the Israeli government has talked about at fairly high levels. This idea that they're going to make Gaza uh, so unlivable for the Palestinians that they will want to leave. And they're going to bribe other countries to take the Palestinians. All right, next up here, Israeli Defense Minister challenges Netanyahu on long-term plan for Gaza. So the Israeli Defense Minister, Yoav Gallant, said Wednesday that Prime Minister Netanyahu must formulate a plan for post-war Gaza and rejected the idea of Israeli military rule. Gallant said, Gallant said that if non-Hamas Palestinian rule doesn't get established, Hamas will be able to reestablish it itself in areas where the military has been dismantled as long as Hamas remains control over civilian life in Gaza it may rebuild and strengthen itself thus requiring the IDF to return and fight in areas where it's already operated in the absence of such an alternative only two negative options remain Hamas's rule in Gaza or the Israeli military rule in Gaza the meaning of indecision is choosing one of the negative options. The Israeli defense minister said that he has repeatedly brought up the issue with the Israeli security cabinet, but that his concerns have been ignored. Galan said that he would not agree to the establishment of an Israeli military rule in Gaza and called on Netanyahu to reject the idea of military occupation even with the possibility of personal or political costs. Netanyahu has said that Israel must maintain security control over Gaza indefinitely and has strongly rejected the idea of establishing a Palestinian state. Netanyahu hit back at Golan saying he's not willing to replace Hamas a stand with Fatah a stand, referring to Fatah, the political faction that has the Palestinian authority. Netanyahu said the issue of post-war Gaza shouldn't be discussed until Hamas is defeated, a goal the U.S. believes is unrealistic. And so this is one of, I think, the bigger omissions throughout the war from the Israeli side that, you know, we, we've we had the U.S. government telling the American people for months now, we have to help the Israelis achieve their objectives in Gaza. We have to help the Israelis achieve their objectives in Gaza. Well, the Israelis don't even have a plan for what they're going to do with Gaza. So how can we help them achieve their objectives if they actually don't have a, a set series of objectives of what they're trying to accomplish here? This is absolute insanity on the part of the Americans continuing to support this. Some Israeli ministers and lawmakers have called for Gallant to be fired over his remarks, including Ben Gavir, the leader of the Jewish Power Party. He said, from Gallant's point of view, there is no difference between whether Gaza is controlled by the IDF soldiers or whether Hamas murders, murderers control it. This is the essence of the uh, conception of the defense minister who failed on October 7th and continues to fail even now. Such a defense minister must be replaced in order to achieve the goals of the war. And I don't think that he was, Gallant was saying there's no difference between the IDF or Hamas ruling Gaza, but that both are negative uh, for, for Israel. And that, of course, is because the Israeli forces, if they're forced to occupy Gaza, are going to be attacked a lot. And right now, from what we're seeing in Gaza, 
the Israeli forces are, are are seeming to have quite a quite a bit of struggles against Hamas and the armed groups of Pal- uh, Gaza at this point, and are are taking some pretty serious casualties. Now, of course, that doesn't compare to, to the number of Palestinians being killed or anything like that, but. Uh, th- these are probably unacceptable losses from the view of the Israeli military. All right, next up here, Biden moves forward over $1 billion in weapons for Israel as tanks push deeper into Rafah. So the Biden administration has notified Congress that it intends to move forward with a weapons package for Israel worth over $1 billion as Israel is pushing its tanks further into the southern Gaza city of Rafah. The arms package, first reported by the Wall Street Journal, includes $700 million in tank ammunition, $500 million in tactical vehicles, and $60 million in mortar rounds. The arms could take years to deliver, but the deal demonstrates the U.S.'s long-term commitment to arming Israel, despite President Joe Biden's warning that he could stop supplying certain types of weapons if Israel launches a major attack on population centers in Rafah. It also shows Israel that any tank munitions it uses in Rafah will be replenished in the future. Reuters reported on Tuesday that Israeli tanks had entered residential districts in eastern Rafah, which would seem that it has to be like, you know, Israel literally drove its tanks over Biden's red line not to attack population centers in Rafah, but here we go. And it doesn't look like there's going to be any any repercussions here. While the U.S. said it would put a hold on one shipment of 2,000-pound bombs, National Security Advisor Jade Sullivan said Monday that the U.S. will continue and is committed to Israel and will make sure it received all the $17 billion in new military aid that was recently approved by Congress. We are continuing to send military assistance and we will ensure that Israel receives the full amount provided in the supplemental. We have paused a shipment of 2,000 pound bombs because we do not believe they should be dropped in densely populated cities. We are talking with the Israeli government about this. Initial reports about the delayed bomb shipment said a pause would was also on a shipment of 500 pound bombs but now u.s officials are also only mentioning the 2000 pound bombs when asked to clarify if there was a hold on both the state department pointed antiwar.com to the above statement from sullivan so that would seem to indicate uh to, to myself and dave who actually asked and uh the state department here uh you know if it was 500 and 2000 pound bombs that's really only the 2000 pound bombs so Sullivan also made it clear that Israel's push into Rafah still hasn't crossed by its red line, if one exists at all. He said, we still believe it would be a mistake to launch a major military operation into the heart of Rafah that would put huge numbers of civilians at risk without a clear strategic gain. The president was clear that he would not supply certain offensive weapons for such an operation were to occur. It has not occurred yet, which, again, is just baffling that he could say that. Before Israel launched its U.S.-approved operations in Rafah to capture the border crossing last week, it was estimated that the city was packed with 1.4 million civilians. The U.N. said on Tuesday that about uh, 450,000 Palestinians have been driven out of the city so far and are warning that there's nowhere safe for them to go. The Israeli operation has been cut off aid deliveries through the vital Rafa aid crossing, adding to the starvation blockade on the Strip. So let's talk about aid groups. Uh, Israel bombed at least eight organizations that informed IDF of their location. So this is from a Human Rights Watch report. A Human Rights Watch report finds... Israeli forces have carried out at least eight strikes on aid worker convoys and premises in Gaza since October 2023, even though aid groups have provided their coordinates to the Israeli authorities to ensure their protection. Israeli authorities did not issue advance warnings to any of the aid organizations before the strikes, which killed or injured at least 31 workers and those with them. More than 250 aid workers have been killed in Gaza since the October 7th assault in Israel, according to the UN. One attack 
on January 18th, 2024, injured three people who are staying in a joint guest house belonging to two aid organizations, as was most likely carried out with a U.S. made munition, according to one of the organizations and to a report by U.N. investigators who visited the site after the attack, which Human Rights Watch reviewed. One of the aid organizations, Medical Aid for Palestinians, said UN inspectors concluded that the bomb was delivered from an F-16 aircraft. F-16 aircraft used British-made components, according to the campaigners. So this is uh, pretty serious. And then we also have Israelis, just civilians, uh, blocking and, and destroying aid shipments to Gaza. So Reuters reports Israeli protesters blocked aid trucks headed for Gaza on Monday, stewing food packages on the road in the latest in a series of incidents that have come as Israel has pledged to allow uninterrupted humanitarian aid supplies into the besieged enclave. Four protesters, including a minor, were arrested at the protest at the checkpoint west of Hebron in the Israeli-occupied West Bank, according to a statement from lawyers representing the protesters. And really, you should call them hooligans. It's It's amazing that some of these U.S. mainstream organizations will call these people who are literally destroying aid headed to starving children as protesters and yet will condemn our own college students as uh, supporters of Hamas and, and things like that. So videos circulate on social media showing the protesters throwing supplies from the shuck, truck on the ground with the contents open carton lane spilled across the road. I also saw another video that shows the protesters and i guess this case you really can't call them protesters but maybe rioters had actually removed the the truck driver and had beat him and, and so you know this is getting far more serious and far more violent all right palestinian aid agency to close jerusalem headquarters after arson attack so middle east eye reports a group of israeli settlers on thursday launched several attacks on the headquarters of the u.n agent Aid Agency for Palestinian Refugees, UNRWA in East Jerusalem, setting fire to the perimeter of the building. According to Palestinian news outlet Wafa, the settlers burned trees and grasses on the building property, which is located to the Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood. The news outlet reported, citing several eyewitnesses, that UNRWA staff members were present at the headquarters and were to put out the fire and stop it from spreading. Meanwhile, Israeli security forces were reportedly present at the site but didn't prevent the settlers from setting fire. There were no injuries reported, and the fire caused extent to damage to the property. And again, it was forced to shut down its headquarters, UNRWA, in Jerusalem because of the arson. Next up here, Jewish Biden appointee resigns from Interior Department over Gaza slaughter. So an Interior Department official has become the first Jewish political appointee to publicly resign in protest of President Biden's support for the Israeli slaughter of Palestinians in Gaza. Lily Greenberg Call, a special assistant to the Interior Department's chief of staff who had worked for Biden's campaign in 2020 says she could no longer be a part of the administration due to the genocidal war. This was in her resignation letter. I joined the Biden administration because I believe in fighting for a better America for a future where Americans can thrive one with economic prosperity, a healthy planet and equal rights for all people. I have just dedicated my career to candidates who I believe would further this vision. However, I can no longer in good conscience continue to represent this administration amidst President Biden's disastrous continued support for the Israeli genocide in Gaza. In an interview with the AP, Call said Biden was also using Jews to justify his support for the slaughter. She pointed to comments made at the comments made by Biden at the White House's Hanukkah event where he said, were there no Israel, there wouldn't be Jews in the world who were safe. Call said that Biden was making Jews the face of the American war machine, and that was deeply wrong. In her resignation letter, Call wrote, Jewish safety cannot and will not come at the expense of Palestinian freedom. Making Jews the face of the American war machine makes us less safe. According to the AP, Call was a longtime activist and advocate for Israel before joining the government 
In the letter, Call said that she has spent her whole life in Jewish communities in the U.S. and Israel. People in my community lost loved ones during Hamas's attack on October 7th. Beloved killed, displaced, and taken hostage. I am terrified by the rising anti-Semitism around the world, and yet that I am certain that the answer to this is not to collectively punish millions of innocent Palestinians through displacement, famine, and ethnic cleansing. So far, three State Department officials, an Education Department official, a U.S. Army officer working for the Pentagon's DIA, have all publicly resigned in protest of buying support for Israel. Major Harrison Mann, who worked for the DIA, also pointed to his Jewish heritage as a reason for quitting. He said, I want to clarify that as the descendant of European Jews, I was raised in a particularly unforgiving moral environment when it came to the topic of bearing responsibility for ethnic cleansing. My grandfather refused to ever purchase products manufactured in Germany, where the paramount importance of never again and the inadequacy of just following orders were often repeated. All right, next up here, Congress, our congressional committee targets pro-Palestinian groups with investigation. I wrote this one for the Libertarian Institute on May 15th. A House committee announced it was launching an investigation into 20 groups it claims are behind campus protests against U.S. support for Israel's war in Gaza. In a letter to the Treasury Department, the members of Congress requested documents on the organizations while smearing them as anti-Semitic and pro-Hamas. On Tuesday, the Committee on Oversight and Accountability and the Committee on Education sent a letter to the Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen requesting all suspicious activity reports, SARs, generated in connection with the following organizations or any known officer or employee thereof. So the list of 20 organizations, and I didn't list off all 20, I just picked some of the more well-known ones, Justice, Students for Justice in Palestine, Jewish Voices for Peace, If Not Now, Open Society Foundations, Rockefeller Brothers Fund, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and the People's Forum. Some of the organizations that are listed are, of course, Jewish-led. The letter says that the committee is investigating the sources of funding and financing for groups who are organizing, leading, and participating in pro-Palestinian, anti-Semitic, anti-Israel, anti-American protests, with illegal encampments on American college campuses. This investigation relates both to malign influence on college campuses and to the national security implications of such influences on faculty and student organizations. So this is extremely concerning. It is absolutely trampling on the First Amendment and uh, uh, the, you know, this letter and what this what these uh, representatives are trying to do is absolutely awful. The protest movement across college campuses carried an overwhelmingly pro-Palestinian message. The students made demands have been a call for a ceasefire and end to U.S. armed shipments in Tel Aviv and that their institutions divest from Israel. Still, the authors of the letter claim that there are more nefarious forces at work. This is Representative Virginia Fox, a Republican from North Carolina, and one of the signers. She said, It's no coincidence that the day after October 7th Hamas terrorist attack, anti-Semitic mobs began springing up at college campuses across the country. These protests have been coordinated and well organized, indicating that outside groups or influencers may be at play. American under education is under attack. So the protesters have been peaceful, with most of the violence originating with the police or the pro Israeli counter protesters. Still, the college students exercising their First Amendment rights have been smeared and targeted by Congress. And the president, in a speech last week, President Biden called the protesters anti-Semitic. He said, on college campuses, Jewish students are blocked, harassed, attacked while walking to class. There's anti-Semitism, anti-Semitic protesters' slogans calling for the annihilation of Israel, the world's only Jewish state. Members of Congress have also introduced a series of bills seeking to financially punish students for joining the protests 
or deport them, strip them of their student loans, things like that. However, a representative uh, bill introduced by Representative Andy Ogles, re Republican from Tennessee, takes the punishment further and is designed to send college protesters to Gaza. So hopefully none of these things pass, but they are very concerning. All right, and then the last article I have here today is another one I wrote for the Institute last night. Democrats fracture over Republican bill forcing weapons shipment to Israel. So Democrats in Congress are breaking with President Joe Biden and preparing to support a Republican bill that will force the White House to ship 2,000 pound bombs to Israel. Biden has threatened to veto the legislation. Last week, for the first time since October 7th, President Biden placed some conditions on U.S. military support to Israel. He informed CNN that if Israel had population centers in Rafah, the White House would withhold some munitions from Tel Aviv. U.S. officials confirmed to the Washington Post that one shipment of bombs had been suspended. While restricting the arms marks a shift in Biden's Israel policy, it appears to have little impact on Tel Aviv's ability to wage war in Gaza. Israeli forces have conducted attacks throughout Rafah, forcing hundreds of thousands to flee, but the White House says the operations do not violate Biden's red line. Additionally, Israeli officials say all the they have all the munitions they need to destroy Rafah, and Washington is already moving ahead with a separate arms package worth more than $1 billion, containing tank shells, mortar rounds, and other munitions. Ambassador to Israel, Jack Lew, explained that the U.S. and Israel do not have real disagreements, and the relationship between the two nations has fundamentally not changed. He said, Just to be clear, we're providing an enormous amount of aid, and we have been since before October 7th. It's increased since October 7th, and even this week, everyone's focusing on the decision to delay to hold just one set of munitions, everything else keeps flowing. It's a mistake to think that anything has fundamentally changed in this relationship, Lou uh, explained. Nevertheless, on Capitol Hill, the policy shift has generated a major backlash. Republicans have introduced a bill that would force Biden to send the blocked weapons to Israel. Also, Florida Representative Corey Mills introduced articles of impeachment against the president, saying it was illegal for the president to place conditions on USA to Israel. President Biden vowed to veto the law if it passed Congress, with the White House slamming the bill as a misguided reaction to a deliberate distortion of the administration's approach to Israel. And for once, it's kind of hard to disagree with the White House. At least some Democrats in Congress are prepared to break with the president. Representative Richie Torres told Atsios he will vote with the GOP. I have a general rule of supporting pro-Palestinian legislation unless it includes a poison pill like the cuts to domestic policy, he explained. A group of 26 Democrats signed a letter slamming Biden for blocking the shipment. We are deeply concerned about the message the administration is sending to Hamas and other Iranian-backed terrorist proxies by withholding a shipment to Israel. With democracy under assault around the world, we cannot undermine our ally Israel, especially in her greatest hour of need. America's commitments must always be ironclad. Representative Greg Landsman, a Democrat from Ohio, issued a statement saying he would vote with the GOP-led bill. House Speaker Mike Johnson, a Republican from Louisiana, is expected to hold a floor vote this week in the House on the legislation, though Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer said he will not allow a vote in the upper chamber and that's dead on arrival. So we will see how this all plays out. But a bunch of Democrats voting with the Republicans in in the, the House will uh, be a pretty you know major kind of political note for uh, consensus within the Democratic Party, especially when it comes to Israel. All right, everybody, that's where I'll wrap up the show for today. Again, thank you all so much for tuning in. Catch me on uh, Judge Knapp's show later today, uh, the Scott Horton show this weekend sometime, and, of course, uh, check out my appearance on Kyle Matovich's show earlier this week. All right, thank you all so much for tuning in. We'll do one more show this week.